Finance Podcast. My name is Bree, and I'm joined by my friend Victoria, aka Biblio Lifestyle. <laughs> Victoria, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy you're here. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. I feel this has been long overdue between us. It is way overdue. I mean, listeners, we literally just chatted for like 20 minutes before we even got on. Very typical, I feel like. I was like expecting that to happen. It's just always so fun to catch up with you. Can you tell everybody about you? You do a lot of things. So tell us all about you. Tell us your everything that you do because you're so incredible and you do so much in the bookish space thank you I really appreciate that Brie and yes yeah, sometimes I do feel like I do a lot but uh most folks know me on Instagram at my username biblio lifestyle but I also have a website that I consider a home and a hub for aspiring and avid readers so it doesn't matter where you are in your reading journey you can come on the website, you can find resources, and you can find support no matter where you are without, you know, all the pressures and overwhelm. So I've organized the blog section into categories so you can find book list, reading tips, and just all the things. So whatever you need, it's there. I also host a podcast myself, the Reader's Couch podcast, where, again, I introduce you to new authors and books, but also share tips to help you along your reading journey. But I'm also very passionate about passionate, sorry, about wellness. So I want us to be living well and reading well. And I want us to do both of that together. I host a festival, the Epigraph Literary Festival. So uh, you can find all that on the website as well. And uh, yeah, I just, I love talking books with readers. I love hearing about what they're reading, sharing what I'm reading, and just, you know, getting clear on where we are in our respective reading journeys and just help us be more intentional, uh, maintain our reading habits and just kind of stay inspired. So um, anything books? I'm all here for it. Yes. You're like the book hustler. <laughs> the book hustler. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. So take us back to the beginning. Like what was life looking like at the time? And you were like, I'm going to start this thing. It's going to be Biblio lifestyle. How did we get to where we are now? Well, if I'm being honest, life wasn't looking good at the beginning. So when I decided to kind of go out on a limb with Biblio Lifestyle, creating this brand new page, I had moved to the States probably mm, two, three, two years, three years before. And I was kind of unhappy because I had to start my entire life completely over. Um, I thought just moving to the States would have been an easy transition. My background is in healthcare. So I thought, okay, uh, based on my husband, who's American, he's like, well, you have to apply to state and, you know, get your license and you should be good to go. But upon arrival, it wasn't that simple. Um, there was a lot of talk about going back to school. I'm like, wait, I have a master's degree, but they're sending me back to do an associate. So it was, it was very heart wrenching. And as someone who, um, you know, got herself out of debt, I didn't want to go back into yeah. debt um, for school. So I found a workaround with the state, got my license, but then again. There were hurdles to being hired, getting insurance um, for employment, not personal insurance, but it was just, there were a lot of hurdles. And if I'm being honest, I was incredibly depressed. So moved to a new country with my family. I was trepid about it, but also excited. And then it was just hit after hit after hit. So I retreated back into books, which is something I've been doing my entire life especially during incredibly diff difficult moments. Um, I retreated into books and I just started reading again. And I had an Instagram account. I was sharing my travels at the time because that's what I was doing a lot of. And this is 2015, 2016 to give uh, folks some context. And I posted a book I was reading 
and a person who was not a family or a friend commented. And then I started seeing folks leaving hashtags bookstagram and I was like what is this and I went down the rabbit hole and I never looked back so I started on Instagram it's fair to say but like most folks Instagram has changed over the years and I realized I wanted a place where I could connect with readers that wasn't on social media Uh, folks were complaining they were missing my post they didn't know what was going on so I decided I was going to create a website the website led to the newsletter and here we are today one of the things that if you if you listeners if you get Victoria's newsletter you do these reading guides and i mean we're approaching summer and the summer one is just always so fun but like take us through so like you sit down we'll 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 do summer since summer's coming up like how are you like first of all I guess like I want to ask like what does the reading look like for these guides because you're reading these books before you, you're not just like, oh, this is coming out. I'm going to put it in the guy. Like you actually read these. So like, I guess my question is like, how do you curate the the TBR or like the list of books to sit and read? And then I'm assuming like, if you don't enjoy a book, it's not going to go in the guide. But like, wh- how does the preparation even look like for this? Because you do it, you're still like looking out for other readers, which I think is so fun. Like that's the whole point of, of your guide is like, you're such a reader's reader, like, you know, a champion of readers. So it's such a selfless thing that you do, but I'm like, how, what is like, I guess there is a part of it that is business. Like you have to sit down and actually spend time with those books. So like, how is the curation of that happening? Does that make any sense? (laughs) A hundred percent. It makes sense. And it's a very long process. So first, I want to step back and say, I share four reading guides a year, one for each season. So the first guide for the year is technically winter. And that comes out the first Friday in December, ahead of the holidays, because I know people get busy, I get busy too, and I hibernate. So I want to get that guide out there to you first. So the first guide for the calendar year would be the winter reading guide. Then we have a spring reading guide, which comes out in March the first Friday or second, depending on the calendar year in March. But then the largest guide is the summer guide. And that always comes out Memorial Weekend for um, or American Friends. Uh, sometimes it ties in with the UK bank holiday. Uh, but living in the States, I focus on the Memorial Weekend because the first thing I learned was it's an unofficial kickoff to summer because yeah. technically summer starts in June. So it's the largest because you're covering like yes. beginning of June, July, August, and summer doesn't actually end until September. So 100%. the most months. Okay. Yes. Yes. So actually the summer guide covers May because okay. a lot of great summer books and Start summer coming. reads and even beach reads, they come out in May. So the guide covers May, June, July, bits of August, but I tend to hold off on the September because I have the full guide that comes out the first Friday in September. So now that um, I've shared the calendar of guides, we can now go into summer because summer is the largest guide with numbers of books. um, It's the longest period without a guide. It requires the absolute most work. So work for the summer guide. (laughs) And I know people are going to think I'm crazy, but work for the summer guide actually starts in October of the year before. So it's summer 23. The summer reading guide is available right now, but the work for that guide starts in October. Oh my gosh. You were reading summer books in October? I know, I know, it's wild. So summer preparation starts in October and the first step is the most tedious, the most exciting, but I have to say it's not my favorite and it is reviewing the catalogs, reviewing the pitches, just reviewing everything and organizing it according to months. So in October, I'm mostly sitting there reviewing all the catalogs that I get sent, all the pictures I get sent, and I'll seek out catalogs on my own. So it's really research intensive that um, 
that first month. I'm going to give myself a month. Now, granted, it's not all summer. I do pull some spring books from that research period as well. But we start in October and I curate a list. After curating the list, I put together my TBR. So the TBR would be books I think are noteworthy, interesting, debuts, Um, Just anything that catches my attention, I'll curate the list and start there. Then it's the process of, you know, requesting the books, um, responding to the pitches, if I received a pitch for the book, to get an actual copy, whether physical or digital or PDF, whatever it might be, of the book so I can read. And normally I start cozying to read around the holidays. So When I said I got rid of the winter reading guide in that first week in December, it's because I really start hibernating after Halloween. Halloween for me is the unofficial start of the holiday season. I start to slow down and that's when I really hunker down and I start reading. And I'm basically reading for this guide from, I would say, around November, November, late November to be safe if it's a bad busy year, Uh, late November and I'm reading straight through till around early May. Late April if I'm on time and I'm early uh, but I try not to go past the first week of May just because I want to sit with these stories, I want to review my reading journal, I keep a physical reading journal, I have index cards inside the books and I want to revisit the things that made me love the book, um, the themes in the book and um, you know just start organizing the categories so um, yeah it's a long reading period but I like to give myself a breather if I start reading a book and I'm just not loving it I set it aside it never makes it in the guide sometimes I'm reading a book and I recognize within myself it's not the book it's just not the right time so I'll set it aside and I'll try revisiting it at another time If I don't end up revisiting it, it never makes a guide. Sometimes I revisit and it's really good. Sometimes a reader might bring to my attention a certain book that I might have missed. Or, you know, um, the books from the publishers that the, the publication date changes or something happens and I'm like, okay, we're dropping this book or I'm gonna add this book. Because when I do that initial review in October, it's so early, so many things can change between then and the actual summer. So I always leave April for that last minute reading, any reader recommendations, anything I see that's noteworthy, buzzworthy, last minute uh, push for a book, I'll try and squeeze it in. But I tend to stop reading three weeks before, four weeks to three weeks before, and really sit with it. And then I get into putting the books together. And that's just the books for the actual guide. So at what point, because I mean, we talked about like the creation of Biblio lifestyle, like what were you doing in life that you were like, I need to create a reading guide, like a seasonal, seasonal reading guides to send to people. So reading guides have, have a long history with me. And Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to uh, going to school and getting that reading list. But before I was even assigned reading in school, and provided with a summer reading list, my mom would always purchase all the books for my school and the the additional recommended reading, but not necessarily needed. She would purchase all those books by the end of June. She Mm -hmm. was just very, very particular about that um, when I think back. So she wanted me to spend my summer reading ahead for school. I don't know what the psychology was. I don't know what she was thinking. Actually, now that I'm mentioning it, I think I'll ask her the next time. Mom, why did you buy all our books <laughs> in June and provide them for us? The only thing she was purchasing in August before school started, first week of September, you know, was school shoes because she was like, well, your feet are going to grow and your uniforms, you know, you might stretch over the summer. Um, but outside of that, we always had our books ahead of time. So I always had a guide. I knew what I was going to read. I was always 
also a member of my local library at the time, and we had reading competitions. Now, reading competitions isn't what you think. It wasn't about reading out loud or how good of a reader you are. It was more reading comprehension, but they called it reading competitions. So they would provide you with a list of books again. You would read it. Um, they would have like a little quiz at the end um, of the assigned period and uh, you get a prize. So again, my my paternal grandmother, her best friend had a bookshop. And when my mom would go to the market on Saturday, she would take us with her. But she would leave me at the bookstore. My sister would sometimes stay, um, but she would leave me there because I would sit in the corner and I would be reading the books. And she was a good friend. My grandmother always had a tab and I would often leave with a book I'd be gifted a book and she would create summer reading guides so I've always had guidance every summer with what to read whether it was mom getting me early books with required reading the library um, having the reading competition I participated in or the bookstores having reading guides it was just a culture I grew up around it was something I was used to Again, you you could just grab a reading guide from a, a bookshop. They would have them printed. And even to this day, because I do collect books and there are retailers I shop from across the world, mostly UK, I would get a reading guide within my package or a, a catalogue of what to buy. So I've always had a guide in my life. So I wanted to provide that for readers as well. Well, I have to ask, do you have a favourite season that you read for like like which season do you feel like you look forward to the most of like creating the guide and is it like because of like I can assume like fall is a really fun mm-hmm. one to put together because it's like those cozy aesthetic <laughs> books or whatever but I mean but they also each season I feel like it's just so special and so fun like I love spring and I'm like I love spring reads but they tend to kind of get slept on because you're also prepping for summer so like yeah. which is your fave so hands down it's always a fall and it's not because you know of the cozy vibe that season uh, gives us I think for me it's always going back to school and Mm -hmm. it's that back to school vibe Um, like I shared with you before we got on here I always knew school was the first Monday in September always 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 Um, so it's it's that mood of getting you know getting ready, getting prepared. September's always felt like a new year to me. I look forward to the fall or the autumn, whatever you say. I always look forward to it. And also, I think because the it's also the last hurrah for books. So when I look at the book publishing calendar, like I said earlier, I've noticed there's a there's an abundance of great books that come out in May for the summer. And this year's guide is truly reflective of that. Um, I had such amazing reading with books that graced bookshelves in May. But I also feel there's something about that late August to September. I feel it's the last hurrah for the year. So in the summer now, you know, I am enjoying those books and I can't wait to share with readers what I think they should be cozying up with in fall. I also try to keep that list super curated and short. Um, But this year with summer, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to make it big. I want to give readers options because there there were just so many good books out there. But I really look forward to the fall. And I would say second best would be winter, actually, just because most of us, you know, depending on where you live, um, if the weather is bad, if it's cold, you know, if you're snowy, um, it's peak reading season for you. And, um, you know, in the summer, you're more out and about. And I want you to just have light fun reads and also you're picking up books at your leisure so I would say fall hands down I love fall I'm assuming you're you're not a mood reader because it sounds like you can just pick up whatever is that the case I'm actually a mood reader so here's the thing okay I'm reading for the guide but I'm not forcing myself to read the prescribed books at a prescribed time. I'll get done and I'm like, hmm, what am I in the mood for? I just got done, you know, reading, let's say a twisty thriller and it was just so, you know, exhilarating and either the ending was just a great big letdown or it blew my mind, you know? And I'm like, okay, what am I in the mood to read next? You know, do I want to read something that's, you know, gritty and thrilling or do I want something more cozy? Or after this terrible ending, I'm thinking I I want a happily ever after. 
I want a guarantee or I want to learn something, you know, in a nonfiction book or experience something. Um, so actually, I I'm very much a mood reader. I don't do well with that. Is so you know, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't do well with a rigid list. So I, I definitely describe myself as a mood reader, even though I'm reading for guides. But she gets the job done, people. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. So we have to talk about the book tours because this is just another like, you're such a mad scientist. I don't know how you do all of this. So like, when did you share with everybody? I mean, you, you and I have talked about it, but like share with everybody, like the journey into hosting that and like what inspired you to do it and like the interaction between you and like the publishers like how you're getting the books how you're are you selecting them are they pitching them to you I because again it's like and it's another thing that you do for readers and like part of the reason like I'm, I'm excited to have my friends come on this summer is like I'm really I guess the historical person in me is like trying to capture a moment. Like what does the world, the, the bookish space online feel like right now? And I think you're like the perfect person to have this conversation with because you do so much and interact so much with readers. So like talk about, talk about that journey, like how it started, kind of where you are now and like what the bookish space feels like for you as someone that interacts so much with readers? So I think the first thing that should be noteworthy is that online readers and everyday readers out there in the real world who maybe interact with social media, but not so much, they are two completely different kind of readers. Mm -hmm. And that has been quite interesting to learn and discover as time has gone on. But specifically to the book tours, you know, I think I'd have to take a step back to that beginning, back to that origin story that we that we did earlier in um, our conversation. It's when I started posting online, I had no idea Bookstagram existed. I've spoken to some readers and, you know, they've been followers of the community. Then they decided to be creators in the community. For me, it was just happenstance. I, I just found myself in this world and then I felt encouraged to share more and more and it took off from there. But what was really new to me was the whole influencer marketing. Um, I consider myself an elder millennial. So, um, you know, influencer marketing was something that was very new. My background is healthcare. So everything was just like a treasure hunt and you're discovering new things along the way. And once I kind of got immersed in the influencer community, and I guess you could say uh, uh, I was somewhat of an influencer myself, I started realizing folks would would be gifted books for free. And I was like, wow, really? Because I'm here borrowing books from my library. I'm here purchasing the books I'm interested in and I'm sharing about them. But there was this huge disconnect. I really didn't understand how, you know, people were getting books for free. And I discovered as time has gone on, you know, publishers were testing the waters in terms of influencer marketing and so on. And um, I was new to that. So then I started receiving books for free and so on. I also had participated in a book tour um, a handful of times. And then I found myself at a unique crossroads. It was 2019. And there was a lot of debate about who gets books, who doesn't get books. And, you know, how can we better improve the system? Now, the first thing I want to say is behind the scenes, it's really incredibly difficult. And as time has gone on, I've actually, um, I've actually had a lot more empathy because I, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that they're real people mm -hmm. behind, um, you know, these publishing accounts and running these publishing programs. And because we're human, you know, there's room for imperfection, but I decided, well, you know what, if I can help in some way, I would want to be a part of that. I would want to be a bridge. So I essentially reached out. I said, Hey, I know you have this program, but I think it would be really helpful if we could start off by reaching readers you know books are intended for so um for folks who are familiar with the online book community own voice reviewers might be something you've heard of and you know books that resonate with a certain group of readers because it's more related to, relatable to them depending on their background and their lived experiences and um i wanted to be a part of that so in 2019 i reached out to a handful of publishers i essentially pitched myself uh, 
um, a lot of people thought I was crazy. <laughs> um, a lot of people ghosted me. It is what it is, but I just wanted to be fully transparent and say, hey, look, if you're out here trying to do the thing, that is very much normal and real. You're going to get a lot of it. I'm still getting it. And um, I essentially reached out and pitched myself and a few folks took me up on the opportunity. And uh, here we are. Now, it is a, a mutually beneficial relationship in that I will request certain books. Sometimes I'll say yes, yeah, sometimes I'll say no sometimes I'll say well hey we already have this planned and they'll also pitch me in return so if it's something you know I don't feel good about or I don't think I can represent well or you know reach the people that they want to reach you know you politely decline and you know say hey look I appreciate this opportunity I don't think this is a good fit at this time so um, I feel incredibly fortunate that I get to do what I want to do on my terms uh, to the best of my ability so it's definitely definitely, you know, mutually beneficial. One thing that you said is that, um, you know, you can, you can say like, I don't think this is a, is a good fit or I, you know, I don't think I can represent this well. And I think for anybody that's coming into this space or like, you know, they're, they're trying to, for some readers, kind of the goal of like, I've made it or I've done a, a good job is to get that free book from a publisher. Right. Mm-hmm. And then before you know it, you're kind of saying yes to everything. Is Mm -hmm. that like backing yourself into a corner? Like how, what advice do you have to that new blogger, that new reviewer, whoever, who's just like saying yes to everything? Because I just don't think people realize how overwhelming the, you know, receiving so much can become because there is kind of, there's an expectation that you're going to do something with everything that you're, you're getting. Yeah, absolutely. And here's a little known fact. It's sometimes when you do say yes to everything and life happens and you're not able to deliver, whether it's on a feature or a review or whatever you agreed upon, um, you know, it, it, it sours relationships. But also more than anything, I want to take a step back and kind of remind folks that publishing is a business. It's a hobby for most of us. And it's something that we have maybe a lifelong affinity with. In my case, I've always been a reader. I've always loved books. And for some people, it's new and they're loving reading and they're exploring this, um, you know, beautiful world that I think, you know, books and reading has to offer. But I think it's very important to remember publishing is a business. So even though you are receiving a book for free even though the publisher is the person making the book and obviously making most of the money because there's also a conversation to be had about authors and how they are paid and compensated um there is a cost attached to it and someone is paying for it and it's not always you know the publisher sometimes it's the author who is shouldering that burden because they want to get their books out in the hands of readers online and influencers to help promote their book so one thing i want to say is always remember that there is a cost associated with the book. Um, It might be free to you, but someone is paying for Mm -hmm. it. So you might not know who's paying for it, but rest assured someone is paying for it. It's it's an expense. So I want folks to to just really think about that at first, because if you were running a business and you were just giving things away, you'd make nothing and you wouldn't be in business for much longer. So that's number one. Number two, in order to survive in this community, you have to do what feels true, natural and authentic to you because if you start chasing books or chasing numbers or doing what everyone else is doing you're not fulfilling yourself so I want you to sit with yourself for a moment and ask yourself what is it that I really want what do I hope to achieve or gain from this you know do I want free books so I never have to buy another book again okay great but are you reading the books are you simply shelving the books is it gluttony what what is it what is really driving you because sometimes if you ask yourself you know this question you will get a real answer and maybe it is not accepting all the books or maybe it's only reading certain books because this is what you and your spirit and your reading life needs right now so have an honest conversation with yourself about what you really want because if you're chasing what other people are doing or you know you want to post a huge stack of books on a Tuesday or whatever day of the week it is just to say oh 
oh, I received all these books for free. Why? So I really want you to ask yourself why. Um, another thing to survive is read what you want to read. You know, be honest and just read what you want to read. So even though everyone is posting about this particular book, if it's not up your alley, if it doesn't sound like something you're interested in, it's something you would never read normally, don't force yourself to read it. Um, don't, you know, again, accept the book, even if it's being gifted for free, because again, it's sitting on your shelf when it could have gone to someone else who was actually um, interested in it. And show up how you want to show up. I know now that I'm listening to myself, I'm saying, well, you know, I'm probably saying the same thing multiple times. But I think it just goes back to if you're not doing what feels true and natural and authentic to you, you can get burnt out really quick. You can feel uninspired. You can fall into a reading slump or you'll just, you know, disappear from the community altogether. If you find yourself jumping on bandwagons, challenges, you know, now with TikTok, stitching videos in response to other things just to have a moment you are going to burn out. This is a very long game. Books and publishing is an incredibly long game and everything takes time. And if you're not doing something you're happy with, it's just going to bring you more misery and heartache than anything. As someone who's been on, I think I started my Instagram in, I always want to say 2018, but it actually might have been 2019. I have been very sporadic with my posting this year and a lot of last year, just because I did hit that burnout. And I, I've been, I've been sitting in the, in the why. I think that's what I've been sitting with these, you know, this year and, and some of last year, just like, why do I want to do this? You know, if I'm posting, why do I want to post? Um, and who knows, you know, one, maybe one day I'll get back to like regularly, you know, every day or every other day posting and and being part of the community. But I'm like, I just can't force it anymore. Like I just, it does not feel genuine. It doesn't feel intentional. And I don't want to do it just because, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's one of those things. (laughs) And I, I've had tons of conversations about this with my mother is that um, all my friends, the one thing they would say is, Victoria is very persistent. She always finishes what she starts. And I said, you know why? It's because I was forced to as a child. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing now, because it's definitely not something I do, especially to the degree and the rigidity um, of how I was raised. I I do it completely different now. However, I think sometimes it's okay to walk away from things because I would be, I think I need to say here as well that Biblio Lifestyle wasn't the first bookish thing I started. It wasn't my first foray into trying to get into the book community or, you know, create community or relationships with um, publishers and readers and just everybody in the in-between. I actually started working with uh, local indie bookstores. I created a page. It was called BiblioFinder. I had hundreds. I, yeah, I think I hit thousand um, of, you know, bookstores um, that I was working with that were um, listed. I I conducted interviews on their behalf. You know, I, I was working with indie bookstores throughout. I started that in 2019, but I also had to say goodbye to that platform Mm -hmm. because it was no longer serving me. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't achieving the fulfillment I initially had at the beginning. And sometimes, you know, the practical side of it, you know, the financial side to things, you know, you also have to evaluate that as well. So it's one thing if it's fulfilling you emotionally and, you know, you spend a little money on it, that's fine. But if you're not getting that emotional fulfillment, if you're just tanking money or keeping something alive just for the sake of keeping it alive, life. You know, I don't support that as well. Sometimes you do have to close the shutter on that. So, you know, Biblio Finder was a thing. Biblio Happy Hour was a thing. And I had to say goodbye because it wasn't fulfilling me in any way, shape or form. It certainly wasn't, you know, giving me, um, you know, it wasn't paying me. It wasn't doing any of that. So when I sat with it, I realized, you know what, this isn't working on any front, you know, and I had a conversation with my my husband who you know he's just more of my cheerleader than anything and he'll give me sound advice and he says yeah yeah I think it's time and and he agreed and 
um, and said, yeah, maybe it's just time to close the shutters on that. And I did just that. And I'm not going to just sweep it under the rug and forget it. You know, it's I have it on my website that once upon a time in my about page, this is how we got here. And I have RIP. And yeah, I have that little note next to it because, I, you know, I want to remember that, you know what, I did that. And I changed my mind and I decided to pivot. I said, you know what, I enjoy showing up via newsletter form. I get so much joy joy organizing the the newsletter for Friday. I now have a personal email that goes out on Sunday. I I get joy from that and I realize that's the only reason why I've never missed a Friday since starting uh January 2020. The Reader's mm-hmm. Couch in podcasting. What are you, like tell us what inspired the start of of venturing into the podcasting world and I mean how has being in that space like been a game changer for you like so I'm a talker which again Bree said at the top of the hour we were chatting for like 20 30 minutes before we popped on here <laughs> That's and now what we do again. I know but I'm a talker I I I love to talk I love conversations but funny I love to listen as well I love hearing other people's story I love conversation that's really what it is so that's the reason I encourage folks if you see something that catches your attention or if something resonates with you hit reply and let me know on the emails I've had conversation with folks I've never spoken to orally never met personally I don't know them from Adam but we talk on the email chain, they will say, hey, this is exactly what I needed to hear, you know, or this really resonated with me, or I read this book too, or whatever. I love the conversation. Um, I love writing, hence the newsletter. But I also wanted to talk and just I think it was a great way for folks to connect with me because it's one thing to read, but I now I'm a bit more visible, whereas before when I started, I wasn't, you know, so I felt maybe through voice, I could connect with folks. Also, some folks who are not able to physically, you know, read the newsletter, they're not able to print it out, they can't see words, they connect with audio more. I was like, okay, I can deliver this over audio. So that's how it started. But I also found myself wanting to talk to authors, you know, of the books that I've read and loved. Some of the books make it to the guide, some don't, and that's okay. But I've read books, I want to hear from the authors. Let's get on the podcast to talk about it. But I also recognize other readers might not have gotten to that book yet. So the podcast is spoiler free. It's a way for me to connect with authors because again, I love to hear their stories. I want to know um, about you. How do you feel with this new book out here? I want to know your elevator pitch for the book. You know, there's a book synopsis. There's what I've read and I've gleaned. But I want to know from you, you know, what is your book really about? I want to hear it straight from the source. I want to know your backstory on how you got inspired to write a book. Because I think one of the hardest things to do is write a book. I think what I do on a weekly basis is child's play. But these people live with these stories sometimes for years and you know they put it together in a way where I'm not as good with words so I want to hear their stories I also want to hear what they're reading so that's the main reason for going um, down the whole podcasting rabbit hole and then I found myself wanting to share things that I'm also creating so the show right now has a author interview component where I chat with authors and introduce books to you again they're spoiler free so it's a great way to see if you know this sounds like something I might need right now. It's also great if you've read the book and now you want to hear where the author was coming from. You can tune in uh, to that conversation as well and you'll get great recommendations from them. I'm always asking what they're reading to. And then some of the content on the website for folks who connect better with audio, you can get those reading tips, uh, lifestyle, wellness, all that um, on podcasting. And um, I've been having fun with it this year. I launched it in 21. I was doing the one interview a week kind of thing, and it was okay. And I fell out of love with it. And I would, I could not have this conversation and not shout out my very good friend, Laura Yameen, which is our good friend. Yay, Laura what to Yameen. read next. <laughs> yes, what to read next. I adore Laura. I adore her as a human being for so many different reasons. But Laura was the one 
who kind of gave me permission to say, do what you want, experiment with the podcast. She reminded me again, what I said to you folks, you know, in the episode before, in this conversation before that, you're you're free to change your mind. You're free to pivot. You're free to say, this format isn't serving me, or I like it, but this is how I can make it better. Or I feel more fulfilled if I include these little tidbits, because I think sometimes as content creators, we forget that folks don't consume content in the way we produce it. So if we can reach people in other ways and spaces, um, I'm all about doing that. So the podcast has new life since 23. And I've been taking Laura's advice, and I'm making it my own. And I'm really enjoying it now. But full disclosure, the way the podcast is now, it will change. Uh, And I think it's only fair to say that because we are evolving beings, we change and what we want to do changes as well. Yeah. And and when you when you have a project, like, you know, and we we were talking about this earlier, like, you know, podcasting is not free, like we don't do this for free. (laughs) We put a lot of money into it. And I think you do that because you believe in it and you want to give it the best chance that it has possible. Like that's kind of like exactly what this podcast is going through right now. Like it got like full transparency. Like we haven't shared this with listeners yet, but like we, you know, I especially reached a point where I was like looking at numbers and things like that. And I was like, I really love this, but I don't, I don't feel like I can justify us continuing it on after a certain point, if things don't change. And it was like, okay, we have to switch it up. And it's like, how do you do that? And we just kind of sat with it. And I was like, you know what? Spring is coming. Summer's coming. Let's just have fun with it. You know? And it's like, let's bring on friends. Let's let, let's have friends come and talk about books they love. And I like, I'm having a blast. And I know for those long time original OG listeners are probably like, you are not doing the thing that you started out doing. And it's like, I would love to get back to that. I'd love to expand upon that. But like, right now it just feels good to do what feels good right now you know and some things just don't work you know eventually I think people get tired of hearing certain things and you get tired of producing certain things and it's like you just got to lean into like what feels good for you because you still want to show up you still love the thing you know it's like you just got to breathe new life into it yeah like I said if you need to hit pause hit pause if you need to just stop you know, and start over from scratch, you know, do it, whatever feels natural and authentic, um, run with it. And I and I love that you're experimenting with that now, Brie, because I think, again, it goes back to we back ourselves in a corner, we're like, well, this is what we started. It's not what we want to do now. What do we do? And I think all your listeners, all my listeners, just everyone who's consuming what we're creating, they too are changing in their lives. And I think, folks will understand I think they'll understand I think even if it's not what they need right now I think they'll come back when they do and that's okay and that's something I've had to um, live with as well it's the same thing when I decided okay I want to create Biblio Lifestyle I had this page where I was posting my reviews my thoughts and and just everything but I said you know what I needed a clean slate so I created a whole new page and now I'm here with the reader's couch and I said well the reader's couch was the clean slate and where I am now is changing so I'm not gonna start over over from scratch. I'm not going to uh, close the doors on this one. I'm just going to change with it. And I'm hoping uh, readers will come along for the ride. And I think they will do the same just for you. Yeah. And and you mentioned author interviews. And I just have to say, like, for our generation, like, I think of like, growing up as a kid and loving R.L. Stein. Mm-hmm. I never would have heard R.L. Stein do an interview. <laughs> Like if he did, it totally missed me. I just think that like, it's so important. Even like you said, you like, you want to hear their story. You want to hear what they're reading. And like, that means so much to us right now, but also for like some kid who discovers that book like 10 years from now, or, you know, like someone discovers it 15 years from now and like podcasts, Mm -hmm. I feel like aren't going to go away. They'll always have access to these episodes. It's like, oh, wow. Like this author did this interview with Victoria 
back in 2023. And like, I get to hear their voice. I get to hear why they wrote the book. And I also got to a glimpse into like what they enjoyed reading. I just think capturing those voices is so important and so cool. I love that. Absolutely. And it goes back to, there's so many pros and cons for social media, the internet, you know, content creators and everything. Trust me, the list is long, pros and cons. However, I think back to my childhood too, Brie, and the odds of you connecting with an author whose book you were reading and loving on were incredibly rare, like incredibly rare. I never had that as a child. So to see children today, and I love the wide options of books that they have now, especially for young adult books. My gosh, I remember just being so limited and now they have this and they could read the book. And if they want to connect with someone over that book, they can do that online. They can hear from the author themselves. And I think storytelling is important and we read books, we consume stories. And I think what we're doing is we are fostering and we are in encouraging storytelling and just the tradition of that in a different way. So, you know, you might not be writing a book, you might not be sharing a family story or or history or any lore or anything like that, but this is a form of storytelling as well. And I think it's great that we are capturing it. I really do. Yeah, we're so cool. Listeners, I asked Victoria to come here today to share recommendations and and we got on this conversation of beach reads. So as she mentioned earlier, like, you know, it, it's that time of year. We want we want the fun. Um, what? OK, tell me why. Like, why did you immediately go share with everybody? Like, why did your mind immediately go there? Like we got on like side conversations about it, which I can't wait for us to get into. But like immediately you were like, let's talk beach reads, Brie. I think beach reads, the whole concept of it is is very fun. It's interesting. It's unique, but it's also incredibly personal. Uh, because again, when people think summer, there's just something about marketing promotions. I uh, Maybe it's something we've been indoctrinated with, but you do think about beach reads. And beach reads for me, are my favorite kind of book. And my definition of beach read might be different from, you know, someone else's definition of beach read. But I don't want us to just limit it to the beachy locations because I feel historically beach reads used to be those books that were set in beachy locations and, you know, they were very light and they lacked depth. But I think beach reads can offer so much more. I think it's a debate kind of like rereading books you know, is audiobooks reading, um, all those things. I think Beach Reads is something worth discussing and debating because I think we'll find most readers have a different view or similar but uniquely personal view on what a Beach Read is. Yeah. Okay. So this is so interesting because like I was chatting with my friend Chloe yesterday and she is a huge women's fic reader and I've Mm -hmm. picked her brain multiple times. I'm like, so does like chiclet and beach reads fall under the umbrella of women's fiction? And she's like, that is a really interesting question. Cause I mean, she's a fan of those two, I guess, mm-hmm. sub genres as well. And it's also kind of like, do some people consider chiclet beach reads? Can they all be the same? But also and she's like, well, a beach read to me, she's like, I personally love reading thrillers at the beach. She's like, that's what I pack first. So it's like, it is so personal. And it's like men, you know, I hate to like gender this, but like men read on the beach too. So are they considering their their picks a beach read? Absolutely. I think they would be great beach reads. And that's what I'm essentially here to advocate for, to say a beach read, in my opinion, there, there are three main kinds. I think a beach read can be a book that's just purely entertaining because if it's super entertaining, you're going to tear through the book, right? So again, you're spending a day at the beach or two, maybe it's a long weekend for your family or even going camping. Because again, I don't want to just limit it to the beach, but you're on holiday vacation at the beach, you're camping somewhere, you're at the park, you're on your couch. I want that book to be entertaining for you to the point that you're just turning the pages. If entertainment is not what you need, I think beach reads can also have depth. So these are books that are just captivating stories. 
with a lot of depth in it and that maybe that's what you need you know you need that connection you're looking for a book with characters that are incredibly relatable these relatable characters it might come you know with maybe heavier themes but these because these characters are real people to you on the page so they have a lot of depth but then also I think Beach reads can just be light and easy breezy, but they can also be very topical. They can have important themes and, you know, uh, issues and just stuff happening in the world right now. And that can be very entertaining because I dare say a good nonfiction book, a nonfiction book that reads like fiction can be a beach read too. Yes, so it can be give me light. a good memoir. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good memoir, a good investigative piece, a good case study. I mean, there are just so many options. And you can find that in the summer reading guide as well, because all the nonfiction books, there's a memoir there. There is an investigative piece. There's a, 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 a what I would consider um, a book about society and culture. Um, that is very thought provoking in there as well. Um, but there are also mysteries that are maybe light and cozy because I love a good cozy mystery. There's also romance. There is women's fiction. There's even historical fiction. There's some really transportive historical fiction books that can be uh, considered beach reads. So while I think everyone's definition of what a great beach read might be, I think the qualities are there, which is engaging plot, relatable characters, easy to read, page turning, captivating. Those are the things we're looking for. Okay, I found this article and I wanted to read some of it to you. I'm going to like read some and skip some, but I want to get your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So this is from michigandaily.com from June 29th, 2022. So it said, to some, the idea of a beach read fits the dictionary definition, a book you can take on holiday, which is good enough to keep you engaged, but not so serious it will spoil your holiday. Romance fanatics like myself have a different definition, one more like the New York Times American Summer Novel, one featuring a whirlwind romantic story in a vacation spot far from a character or reader's reality. From its conception in the 19th century middle-class vacation culture by authors like Louisa May Alcott, the American Summer Novel genre has been owned by women while immensely popular with readers and placing at the top of summer reading lists critics soon dismissed the genre as light reading skip 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 finally another element of the genre of beach reads is its aesthetic and artistic perception critics and readers including myself treat the entire genre as if it were sinful and distasteful calling the books guilty pleasures or indulgences i admit to hiding the books at the bottom of my beach bag under sand and pent up shame only opening the well-worn pages on an empty beach with my toes in the sand so i think like you said like i think it's very personal but like why is it something that people have shamed so much you think like what is wrong because it is so personal you can read whatever like honestly I, I'm, I feel like as a culture we need to get out of this like shaming people for what they read like mind your business the world is shit enough the last thing that we need is people to be judging what people are reading on the beach but like what do you think it is do you think it's because it has that stigma I think do you think people still assume if we say beach read it is something light and airy and like the easy target of making jokes about so the first thing I thought when you started reading is that is a historical take on what a beach read is Mm -hmm. and you know I don't subscribe to gender norms (laughs) Not at all, not even in my own life. I just, I don't subscribe to gender norms at all. But I think if you go back in history, it was really focused on women, for sure. That, that, that genre, that marketing, I think the targeting was primarily women. Yes, men read at the beach. But then they would dare say, well, the men are off fishing. The women take the, the children to the beach. They're reading to burn the time. You know what I'm saying? Going back to gendered norms. Um, So for me, historically, it was for women. I think women over the years were shamed for reading romance books because I'm old enough to remember romance novels with men on the cover that some women or, again, men, whoever's reading, would feel incredible shame to read these things in public. I remember before these illustrated covers and stuff existed. So I also remember when folks were super critical about reading. So if you were reading what I would consider something contemporary, light, just 
pure entertainment, no value at all except an escape, which I think there's great value in escape. But historically speaking, that would not be considered real reading. Real reading to some folks was reading The War and Peace. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that's a beach read, you guys, but maybe it is for someone. (laughs) Each read for someone, but I remember folks being really snobbish about what books were considered real books and real reading. So that would be more of the literary kind. And look, I love a good literary fiction. I actually think it's what I gravitate to the most. However, I I say the book trials are no longer here. Okay. We're not living in the book trials anymore. You can read whatever you so desire wherever, in public, with no shame. But I think it kind of goes back to the history of women not being taken seriously, women having allegedly, you know, small minds that, you know, they they aren't, you know, thinking, they're not contributing to society, so so they're reading junk. It's kind of like reality television, right? I am guilty of, I used to say, reality TV was my guilty pleasure. No, I'm not saying that anymore. I'm saying I enjoy watching reality TV, especially Housewives, because it provides a platform for women over 50. Whereas before, they never used to have that. And these women have now new lease on life. And I learn more about women and relationships and friendships and family dynamics and all kinds of crazy from reality TV. <laughs> Love so it. they are relatable, just like in the books you know, that's relatable. So no more guilty pleasures. We're not using that word anymore. We enjoy blank, whatever it might be. Just say it loud, say it proud. We enjoy blank. And I think based on that definition, it was very gendered. Men read on the beach too. And you can read whatever you want. I think once it's interesting and captivating to you, that's all that matters because we're not going to force ourselves to read the prescribed list of real books that are considered real reading and critical thinking. Yeah. Have fun with it, people. Jeez. (laughs) I know. Like we're not in school anymore. We're not in work. I advocate for reading for fun and pleasure. If you happen to learn something, great. If it's something you're interested in, go for it. But I don't want folks to read something just because I said you should read it. I want you to read it because after pitching it, you're like, okay, this sounds like something I could get behind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what recommendations do you have? I'm so excited (laughs) to see what's on this list. Okay. So for beach reads, I, I love fiction. So Mm -hmm. let me just put that out there. They're great nonfiction books. So if you want a nonfiction book, I can throw one in there as well. But I wanted to give a book from each category that I said you could have a good beach read from. So where romance is concerned, I really enjoyed Chow for Now by Kate Bromley. Now, this is an enemies to lovers romance. So if you love enemies to lovers, great. It's also set in the summer. So perfect summertime read. Um, If you're living somewhere where it's not warm and you want that warm summertime reading, pick it up. If you want some armchair travel, I'm recommending it as well because the novel is set in Rome and I love Italy. I love Italian travel. I've been so many times. I can never get tired of Italy. It's always a good time. So Ciao for Now by Kate Bromley. Like I said, enemies to lovers romance set in the summertime. It's a rom-com and it centers an American who's interning at a fashion house, but she gets off to a rocky start with the designer's son. Now they're forced to spend time together. So there's that close proximity trope there as well. But as they do, you know, sparks start to fly. You realize he's not as grumpy after all. And, you know, she's a great catch as well. So I really enjoyed it just because of all the travels around Rome. I think the author did an amazing job with the setting. So if you're looking for a contemporary romance, I would give that one a go. Oh, that sounds so good. Italy is my dream destination. And if I see a book that's set there, then I have to read it so okay thank you for that (laughs) yes and it has a little scooter on it which in Italy you know for folks that have been parking is always a nightmare I mean major cities it's always a nightmare but Italy when you're in a very major city or a populated city or a tourist spot parking is always going to be a nightmare so if you have a scooter or just a little tiny car you're in luck I remember one time squeezing in between two dumpsters (laughs) because I was just like man I circled a whole block my family and I did a uh, a house swap um 
with my parents I was much younger before I was married and I remember just having to kind of try and squeak in the car between the dumpster because <laughs> oh my gosh. parking nightmare absolute nightmare but yes it's a great Italian escape um so highly recommend it um okay what's next on my list so contemporary fiction so for contemporary fiction, I want readers to read Yellow Face by R.F. Quang. I just absolutely love it. I know it has a bit of literary to it. It also has a bit of women's fiction to it. It's just an all around contemporary read. I think it's great just because it gives you insight into the publishing world, not just from an author and, you know, uh, author or publishing professional standpoint, but it also gives you just some psychological insight into what authors go through. Because I also think while it has major themes of cultural appropriation, um, diversity, racism, and how social media can be incredibly alienating, it's also just about a lonely woman and a lonely writer who's lost her way. So Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong is a satire. So it's very important to know this. It's a satire about the publishing industry and it centers on a struggling writer who steals her dead friend's manuscript and publishes it as her own oh my gosh okay we've been talking about this book offline and i must have totally missed that part (laughs) i was already like oh i need to get this book because it's about Mm -hmm. publishing and there's just something about books about books that i love (laughs) so Same. same and for a reader I think this book is great because it is a book about books, but it's also a a book about publishing in a way. Again, it satires it, but there's so much truth in it. And if you know of or understand influencer culture, even in the slightest, even if you're just a person who's not creating content, but you're following an influencer, you will be able to relate to this in some way, shape or form, because it really digs deep into the social media of it all. And the reaction of people who've read the book, both from people who love the book, people who don't like the book, um, you know, the author community um, that this author has, the publisher, her agent, it really gets in there, but it does so beautifully. But you have to understand the whole premise surrounds the fact that she stole this manuscript and we see the fallout after that and that ending, it really... (sighs) I mean, the novel took quite a few twists. Again, I'm not going to speak on it, but I'm just going to say it took some twists. I was just like, okay, I I see what the author is doing here. But it also talks about mental health because I, yeah, I have to mention mental health because mental health is very important. So I know some folks will latch onto the cultural appropriation and the diversity um, side of it, which is incredibly important. But it's also um, the social media of it all. My God, I, I was just like, yep, I, I've seen that. I know that, that. I know that to be true. It's just incredibly relatable. I think it's a novel for our time. I really do. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like a good book to have with you on the beach. Yes. And I think readers will tear through it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, books about books. And then I think, I mean, we all, I think it's safe to say, like, social media has touched everyone's lives at some point so yes. it, it, there there's that relatability for sure so yeah mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting yeah, my hands have, on that one <laughs> yeah you don't have to be a content media once social media has touched your life once you've heard about some something that went on on social media and, and you know that the internet is in uproar or in agreement with you can relate because it's very heavy on that so uh yeah All right, so the next book I'm recommending is in the mystery and thriller category for Beach Read. And I absolutely love this one. I thought it was very smart. It was propulsive. It had family, um, family drama, friend drama. But the thing I love about a Beach Read and some thrillers, I love to escape. And this book gave me the best of both worlds. It gave me a mystery that we're trying to solve. It had, you know, very good suspense throughout, thrilling bits as well. But it also took me to a destination. And I love traveling through books. Now, this book took us to a very elite community. It's the community itself is fictional, but the place where it's set is real. So this book is called Bad Summer People by Emma Rosenblum. And it's set in a fictional town on Fire Island. And I think Fire Island is somewhere 
off in Long York. Island. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Long Island, uh, I think. Yeah, Long Island sounds somewhere. Anyways, so it's set on Fire Island, but the town itself is fictional. And it follows a group of upper class New Yorkers whose summer is upended when they discover a dead body off the side of the boardwalk. Face oh, down. gosh. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. But it's also just about the people themselves. You know, there's infidelity, there's backstabbing, and of course, the murder that they're trying to sort. So we kind of see just how their entire summer is upended because of this. And we just, and we watch all the characters kind of unravel. And there's something to me about, you know, people who have second homes and vacation homes, or they have a group of friends that they vacation with all the time. And, you know, um, these upper middle class and, you know, upper class folks just kind of, you know, hoity-toity just going off on vacation and it just gets ruined. There's something about that. And just to kind of see them all unravel and being backstabby, you know, the women, yes. you know, they can, yes, they, they get very backstabby, both about like clothes that someone's wearing. It's just very surface level, trivial, but so entertaining, so juicy. So I highly recommend people pick up Bad Summer People by Emma Rosenberg. I love the title of that one. And I just, yeah, I love those thrillers. It's, I can't wait to read that one because it's like, uh, you know, we're all friends here, but like we mm. are also like only showing our representative. Like you may not know that like my husband is secretly cheating and I know about it or whatever, you know, like the juice. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then something like a murder happens and like you get to know all the de- oh those are so good. I I'm so excited. I love those books as well. All right. So our next book on the list. Now I know when folks think of historical fiction they're not thinking beach reads because they're mostly thinking World War II fiction. Now if you're a World War II fiction fan, great. Um, I personally like to veer away from that. I'm okay if the backdrop is World War II. I think I've consumed so much World War II fiction. I was about I'm to sure. say, because you love historical fic, and I just feel like mm. World War II is all over. No shade, but World War II is a huge market within historical yeah. fiction. And it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> I know. I know. And I always challenge readers because in the Summer Reading Guide, there is one two books that are set with the backdrop of world war ii however comma it has nothing to To do with it to do with it no it's just a time and then we see everything that unfurls after the fact and then um in the summer reading guide i have a book set during 17th century paris which is absolutely divine it's the book i'm highly recommending it's a minimalist list pick and again 17th century paris I also had a book, 15th Century China. Wow. I'm here for that. Um, there's 18th Century India, Love, which kind of takes us to, to France a bit and um, uh, the UK. And um, I also have one uh, set on a Georgia plantation as well. Oh, wow. So we get American history in the South. And um, so there's a wide range of historical fiction books out there. I just gave a taste of the books you can find in the Summer Reading Guide. <laughs> and for the World War II fiction, it's, you know, it comes to the States, which I really enjoyed. So it's it starts there, but it's about the women and we see um, how their lives have changed. And I, I appreciate that dynamic. Um, so you can expect great, but different historical fiction books in the guide. But for the Beach Reads list, the book I'm recommending is actually not in the guide, but I think it's a great Beach Read. And it's by an author, lots of folks know. And it's by Beatrice Williams. And it's The Beach at Summerlee. Oh, Ab- no. Absolutely love that book. It's a great summer read. It takes me to a place I love to be in during the summer. And that's going up in New England. I just love the Northeast and that area during the summer. The weather's great, but there's just so much history there. And it takes readers to um, a family. Um, you know, they're rich, uh, glitzy, uh, have this, you know, really nice home. And it has a lot of Cold War history in this book, which I really appreciated. And it's kind of set during those World War II years. So it's 1946, but it also has another timeline in 1954. But I just really appreciated just how, um, you know, we get a summer season during the seaside estate of this wealthy family 
We see the daughter, her her year round caretaker. You know, we get some island history um, as well. It's just it's just so. I think the island is what Winthrop Island. Um, so it's it's really great, and we see her make a friend. We see a romance blossom. Um, there's lots of adventure. There's an FBI agent who shows up who needs help in capturing a Soviet agent. Um, there's a lot of intrigue in there, but there's just so much escape, and it's just so good, and it's very transportive. So highly recommend The Beach at Summerlee by Beatrice Williams. Beatrice's uh, historical fic just like glitters. It just sparkles. She's so good. Right? It does, and that's why I think her new book will be an amazing beach read it's set during the summertime you know I love reading about wealthy people I'm sorry it's part of the reason why I started watching housewives even though that has changed but I I love to see wealthy people behave badly and um you know we kind of get a bit of that but we also get a young girl kind of coming of age and we also get that world war ii um elements as well so I think it's a great book um as well Okay, something I absolutely love during the summer and during the fall, and anytime I just need a comforting, small town kind of read with a bit of a mystery at the center. I love a good cozy mystery, I really do. And the thing about cozy mysteries is that sometimes when an author has a really good book, you know, it can tend to be a really long series. And I know folks are very self-conscious about that. And there are two cozy mysteries that I absolutely adored But the one I'm going to recommend is a first in the series because the other book is just number two. It's a standalone. And I think I read somewhere that even the book I'm going to recommend, the author wants each book to be a standalone. And I love a good cozy that is a standalone. So the book I'm recommending also has some historical um, elements to it as well. And this book is entitled A Most Agreeable Murder by Julia Seals. So it's the first book, like I said, first book. And what I love, because it's historical, it it takes us back to that time when people had balls and, you know, 19th century England. Let me give you the setting. So it's set in 19th century England. There's this ball happening and this wealthy bachelor just drops dead. Drops dead. (laughs) We don't know why. And there's this young lady who's in attendance now has opportunity to solve the crime. Now, what I love about the young lady at the center is she has a wild, vivid imagination. Again, it's 19th century England. There's no social media, okay? So this girl has lots of time on her hands and she spends lots of time thinking about murders, you know, what if something had happened, what she would do. Like, she has a whole strategy going on, all right? Um, But as of women of that time, it's very important that she find a husband. So of course they go to all these um, balls and so on. And because she, in her family, she has only sisters that she has no brother. So of course there always comes the, the problem of inheritance because, you know, women can't inherit anything. So they need one of the daughters, preferably the eldest, to be on her best behavior, get married um, so that she can inherit or direct more um, specifically her husband can inherit. And so it doesn't have to go to some cousin who no one likes, who happens to be male, because that's what it was at the time. So Beatrice goes to the ball. She's on her good behavior. Like I said, someone drops dead in <laughs> at the ball. So now everyone's in frenzy. They're in panic. It's obvious they're trapped with a killer there. So, of course, they're trying to figure what happens. And it's just so funny. It's it's a comedy of errors. It's a comedy of manners. It's just so, so, so good. They have tricky card games. You know, they're making all kinds of cocktails. They're making crazy speeches. You know, of course, trying to keep decorum and decency, uh, you know, uh, top of mind always. But I just love the, the, the idea of just a lady of that time taking on role as detective. So I think it's great for friends who love Agatha Christie, which I love me some Agatha Christie, but it's also good for friends who love Jane Austen because there's also another cozy mystery out there with all Jane Austen characters um, and, you know, a mystery is at the heart of it. It's a cozy, but it's set in Jane Austen's world with all Jane Austen's characters in all the Jane Austen locations. This book isn't that But it's good for folks who, you know, love Austin and and love Agatha. 
and even Bronte's. So it's like classic, classic cozy mystery. That's oh, what I would I love say. That. <laughs> I love a cozy mystery too. I never thought of like, cause I feel like when we think of cozy mysteries, I feel like the fall is like a peak cozy mystery time, but yeah, I think cozy mysteries could be so perfect for the beach. Absolutely. They can be. Those are five fiction books that I think would be great beach reads for this year. So Chow for Now by Kate Bromley is your romance. A Most Agreeable Murder by Julia Seals is your cozy mystery. Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang is your contemporary fiction, kind of literary, kind of women's, you know, it's it's very across the board. Um, a mystery with badly behaved people, but very suspenseful is The Bad Summer People by Emma Rosenblum. And the historical fiction would be The Beach at Summerlee by Beatrice Williams. So those are fiction books that I think would be incredibly great Um beach reads i'm just going to throw in a non-fiction i was going to say you had a non-fic too yeah i'm going to throw in non-fiction for good measure hmm which one should i choose so i was thinking memoir Mm -hmm. or something that is more true crime you tell me what do you want to hear about memoir or true crime oh gosh I feel like you have to do one of both because okay. we I we love memoir, but I know a lot of readers are like, oh, I feel like I'm being nosy. <laughs> Which I'm yes. like, oh, whatever. But and I know a lot of readers, a lot of women especially love true crime. So I'm like, I could totally see my sister bringing a true crime to the beach. To the beach. Okay. All right. Let's start with the true crime first. This true crime book is in the summer reading guide, you guys. So I highly recommend it. It's not the minimalist pick this year, but it's still a very good book. So if you're looking for true crime, I highly recommend you read The Con Queen of Hollywood by Scott C. Johnson. Con Queen of Hollywood. Okay. This was a wild ride. Absolutely wild ride. So this book chronicles, because again, it's true crime, true story, not fiction. It chronicles the manhunt, or I rather, I don't want to gender this, no. It chronicles the international hunt for a con artist <laughs> who impersonates and impersonated a whole bunch of Hollywood talent and executives and um, just folks that are, you know, decision makers in Hollywood. It was so bad. Is Any this like old ex- Hollywood setting or no? No, this is this is present day. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> no, no, this is present day. Like they were even searching for this person um, during was it before the pandemic or during the pandemic? Oh my yeah. gosh! No, okay. this 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 is 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 absolutely bonkers. It blew my mind. Um, See, this so, is my kind of true crime. This I, I can do stuff like this. I can do sadly, like I, I can't do too much, like murder but like people mm-hmm. disappearing or like people getting away with stuff I'm like oh that's my true crime drug of choice gotcha gotcha well this one is like I said very true story it's kind of sad because I know normally when folks think of um how should I say when you think of true crime and someone being a con and someone being a grifter they kind of do it for financial purposes right mm-hmm but this is not the case. All right, so let me backtrack. So the grifter in this case, the, the, the person who impersonated the other person is an Indonesian man who from 2015 up to the pandemic, so that would be 2020, impersonated studio executives, talent agents, and other Hollywood A-listers to manipulate gig workers. So I'm not saying this person didn't get money from these people, but once you read the book, you realize for him, it was more emotional manipulation, okay. right? He got cash from some people, but he he got pleasure, it's clear, from emotionally manipulating these people, meaning he wanted to build people up, get them excited about a potential job opportunity only to just kind of pop their bubble. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he would get screenwriters, actors, makeup artists, all kinds of people. You get them traveling to certain locations on their dollar, thinking that they would be reimbursed later, having them pay for, you know, luxury hotel travels, all kinds of things. And then just say, oh, yeah, well, we're deciding not to go in the right direction with this project. Not, We're not going in this direction with this project anymore. 
and he would leave them stranded. Like I said, he got some cash from some people, but it was mostly emotional. So this author interviewed the FBI agent who, you know, numerous agents who were working on this. There was a private investigator who was working with this and he got arrested in 2020 as of the writing of this book and as of the best of my knowledge, because I did some Googling after, is still awaiting trial. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, this is some real life happening right now. Yeah. And this is just a creative criminal mastermind, you know, just basically a grifter. Um, and yeah, just, just basically a grifter. But the book is wild. I think this person is a psychopath, obviously. I can't diagnose anybody, but... It was just the embodiment, in my opinion, of evil. Yeah. This person was just, ugh, I, I just, I don't know how people do these things. But if you're interested in true crime, um, if you're interested, I can see this being a Netflix, Hulu series. Series. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because we got Anna Delvey, which was like a fictionalized version of, you know, inventing Anna, mm -hmm. um, which I watched and devoured. I can see this being something like that like a four episode three episode whatever executives will decide a series but yeah so i if you're looking for true crime i recommend uh the con queen of hollywood how does that sound okay that sounds so good amazing okay so the non-fiction book the memoir so to say that i'm going to recommend is actually on the minimalist list in the guide i enjoyed it for what it is i i, I really did it's not your typical how should I say? It's not your typical memoir about a person's life per se. It's about a bird, a baby magpie. So the book I'm recommending is entitled George by Frida Hughes. Oh, okay. Now, Frida Hughes, first you have to know, she is a, um, she's a writer. Um, I think she's a poet. Yes, yeah, she's a, she's a poet. Almost sure. Let me just say she's a writer and she moved, I think, I'm trying to remember now. Ah, she moved somewhere. I think she moved to either Wales, south of Wales or somewhere. She's in the UK. So she, I, I think she moved to Wales. I don't think it was Scotland. She moved to Wales and she's in the countryside. She bought this house with her husband. And what happened is, you know, it's an older house. So she was expecting to kind of fix up the house, you know, do a little renovating, painting, um, she wanted to do like a garden. She she writes, like I said, she's a writer. And while she's just kind of there minding her business, she discovers this magpie that was by, I'm going to call him because she called him George. So she saved this magpie from, uh, I think a storm had passed through and the magpie was um, survived and the magpie was there. So she basically took this little tiny thing in and she started taking care of him. And we kind of see the transition of the magpie growing from just this little tiny thing, <laughs> um, you know, fresh out the, the egg to it growing to the point where she had to let it go. But we kind of see her journey and her experience kind of caring for it and kind of seeing it just grow you know because she was also kind of going through a rocky time with her marriage and I think I kind of appreciated you know her honesty about that but also how this little magpie kind of gave her purpose and kind of just gave her a new lease on life if that makes sense mm -hmm. so I know it might sound hokey to some people but for me it gave someone purpose in the wake of sadness and you know kind of loss and just how finding this wild magpie just you know how it changed her life yeah uh in a way so for me I kind of like that journey a lot and I would be lying if I didn't say the bird on the book cover caught my attention right yeah I pulled it out I was like I need to see this the, I need to see this book so I pulled it and it's so crazy because I pulled it up on Goodreads and then I don't know if, if this is your influence or what but it said readers also enjoyed yellow face <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> I was like, interesting. <laughs> the fact that someone comped yellow face to George is killing me. Right. I'm like, what? <laughs> this is okay. a memoir about a bird. Okay. <laughs> well, someone got it from the reading guide because both George, well, yellow face is not in a minimalist list, but it's on, in the guide. But um, yeah, so if someone needs a nonfiction book, 
I think this would be a good one. I, I really do. I, I think it's great. Or the con queen for page turning beach read. I think the con queen is definitely a page turning uh, beach read, hands down. So before we get off here, are you reading anything? I hate to say for fun, but I know like you're probably you're in the throat because are you reading for the fall guide right now? Yes. Yes. So I've put together my TBR. I've been reading books before, but I'm looking at more books that I want to read for the fall guide. So yes, in summer, I will be reading all the fall things. But right this second, right this very second, I'm doing something that for some readers is controversial, but it gives me great joy. And I am rereading some books. I am rereading the Outline Trilogy by Rachel Kosk. So it's three books. I think one is Outline, Transit, Kudos. I had read those books when they republished the paperbacks. I don't remember when, but I remember just devouring them. I think it was around 2018, 19, thereabout. And I remember they had republished a set of the three paperbacks. And I'm a huge Rachel Cost fan and I never read the books. I was just like, let me wait because I knew it was going to be a trilogy and I reread them. I absolutely love it. It's a stream of consciousness kind of thing, very literary fiction. I just think she's a great writer and I need to kind of clear my mind. And when I need to clear my mind and reset, I tend to reread. So I the other that. day, yeah, the other day I reread because I hadn't reread it in years, but it was kind of really, really uh, good to revisit, which was um, Thomas Hardy, uh, Tess, Tess the Herbivores. Mm-hmm. I oh, I had such a wonderful time rereading it. See, my favorite Hardy is actually far from Madding Crowd because I love Bathsheba Everdeen in there. But I hadn't revisited Tess in a while. And when I needed a purge between um, reading for the guide, I was like, let me let me read Tess. And I actually reread Gatsby this year. Oh. Which, yeah, which was quite interesting. And I talked about it on uh, one of my podcast episodes just saying – and I'll share it here, is that my challenge with rereading Gatsby this time was the edition I read from, which was the Modern Library edition. It's a black cover. Um, I have it on the website. But I read the introduction first, which I highly recommend people read the introductions in books. I think they're incredibly helpful, especially classics and reprintings. They're really great. And one evening I had settled down. It was late. I was like, okay, let's reread this Gatsby Um, because it's been a while and I read the introduction and the introduction had me stop right then and there and say no you're not reading it now because it was I think it was a Saturday evening and I was like no because the introduction told me not to take my time and read the book instead take the challenge and read the book in one sitting Mm. so I waited until Sunday and I read it in one sitting And it's really a different experience when you read that book in one sitting. Interesting. It really is. It really is. And what I also loved about that edition is it had um, discussion questions in the back. And, you know, it gave us some different points of view, not just from the not just from the writer who his last name is Mosley. I forgot his Wesley Mosley, I think not just from his introduction, but other schools of thought. He came in with different points of view of, you know, people brighter than me who've read it. And they're like, you know, what did you think about this? People have, you know, people suggest that this meant this, or this meant that, or um, how about reading it from the point of view of Gatsby being something else. And it was just, very thought provoking. And for a book that people love to read, especially during the summer, if you're still listening to the podcast at this point, read it in one sitting. That's my challenge to you. Listen to the episode I have. I kind of go into detail on how to approach it. But when I read for fun, I find myself either rereading a book that I've read and loved and I want to revisit because there's some books I really want to know well, not just surface level, And I also find myself going back and reading all the books that have been on my shelf from God knows when, but I've never gotten around to it and I want to read it now. I tend to avoid new books when I read for myself. I love that for you. I do. It makes me happy. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like rereading catches a lot of slack and in in a way it's like we're kind of encouraged to not reread, but there's some, there's, there's, there's comfort in that predictability of like, I have already read this 
before, but also you can pick up something totally different from a book you may have already read twice, you know? So yeah, I love 100%, it. A hundred percent. And it takes me back to my childhood is the last thing I'll say, just because I used to reread books like mad. Yeah. And I remember rereading The Secret Garden so many times and going in my nan's own garden and thinking it's The Secret Garden. Girl, My yes. imagination <laughs> was wild, girl. It was wild. I would reread Rebecca because I was just like, mm-hmm. she's going to mm-hmm. actually be in the book this time. Like, she's going to pop up yes. this time. And she never does. <laughs> and this is why we're kindred spirits. Because for me, Rebecca, all roads lead to Rebecca. I love Rebecca. I've reread Rebecca numerous times I read it from different editions each time to kind of settle in on um one that I'm saying okay well this is a good edition I have collectible Rebecca editions and I have the paperback Rebecca editions three different hardbacks I love her I love a Rebecca yeah love her that is such a rereadable book <laughs> it is it is well plug all your places people can keep up with you online well if you guys aren't sick of me after this interview I'm kidding <laughs> No one's going to be sick of you. I'm joking. You guys can find me at bibliolifestyle.com. It really is the best way to connect with me. I pop in your inbox every Friday with the weekly newsletter rounding up all the podcast episodes, a new book list, if I did an author feature, recipes I'm loving. Um, There's also a giveaway there as well. We love to have fun. Um, So yeah, go to bibliolifestyle.com and uh, subscribe to the weekly newsletter there. You can also find me on The Reader's Couch podcast. So just search for The Reader's Couch. You'll find me there. Again, I talk about all the things that you'll find in the newsletter and sometimes on the blog. And then I bring on some really cool authors to introduce new books to you. Um, I do the festival twice a year. We did the spring summer festival. Replays are available if you want to watch that. But also I am planning a fall festival in September. So September 2023, you can find again, all that information, bibliolifestyle.com. And I have a fun quiz. What's your reader type? So uh, just type in readertypequiz.com and you will find the quiz, find out your reader type. And it will also kind of roll you into the newsletter um, as well. So there are many ways for you to connect with me. I hope to hear from you. Reply to the emails. I do respond. Send me a DM. I'm always accessible. 